So as you're joining us and enjoying the beautiful pictures, please feel free to drop a line in the chat about where you're joining us from. We do have people who join us from all across the country. So if you want to say hi and introduce yourself and just let us know where you're joining us from, that would be fantastic. I'm here in the Denver metro area, but Spencer is um, at the park today. Yes. <laughs> yep. uh, so please, again, enjoy the pictures, but also feel free to share um, where you're joining us from and uh, engage in the conversation. We're going to begin promptly at four, which is in two minutes. Jan Wright is joining us from Mancos. Jan is actually a big supporter of the park and has done some artwork of the dark skies um, in Mesa Verde. So thanks, Jan. Welcome. And we have Marilyn from Sedona, Arizona. I bet it's beautiful, but probably very warm there today. Thanks for joining us. Steve Parker is from Durango. Welcome, Steve. A couple more minutes to let people join. Oh, I'm wrong. Just one more minute to let people join and we'll begin promptly at four. All righty. Well, welcome, everyone. Good afternoon and happy September. I am Shannon Clifford, and I'm the executive director of the Mesa Verde Foundation. If you've joined us for previous webinars, you're likely wondering where our regular moderator is. Monica Buckle is, as we speak at this very moment, moving her home from Connecticut to Arizona. So we will be happy to welcome her back to moderate the webinar in October. As many of you know, the Mesa Verde Foundation is the official philanthropic nonprofit partner to Mesa Verde National Park. As a foundation, we secure funding for parks, capital improvements, special projects, and further promote understanding and preservation for ancestral Puebloan culture. Our public programming is possible solely from donations and the support of Mesa Verde Foundation supporters like you. We thank you for creating this space for this webinar offering. Now, before we get started, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome the new superintendent of Mesa Verde National Park, Casey Cook Collins. Casey has over 35 years of service to the National Park Service and has served as superintendent of several national monuments and parks and has years of experience working with tribal organizations. Welcome, Casey. Today, we are thrilled to have Spencer Burke presenting about enjoying and preserving the dark skies of Mesa Verde National Park. Spencer is a park ranger and a visual information specialist at Mesa Verde. As a ranger with the National Park Service, Spencer has led field trips on hikes into Grand Canyon, developed education programs on the Channel Islands, and collaborated with Pueblo community members to expand Pueblo perspectives in interpretation at Mesa Verde. Spencer received his BA in history from Harvard University and was a John G. Owens Fellow of Mesoamerican Archaeology at the Peabody Museum. Today, Spencer loves fostering connections with and advocating for public lands in Southwest Colorado and beyond. Welcome, Spencer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful evening here in Mesa Verde. Um, it's been a very 
wet summer compared with the last few. So we've been enjoying all the wildflowers and the greenery and the reduced risk of fire here. Uh, it's great to, to see all of you um, joining us today. So I'm gonna get right into my presentation and let's see if I can get the technical difficulties correct. All right, can you all see that? Excellent. Um, so my name is Spencer. I've been a ranger here at Mesa Verde since 2015. I started as a seasonal interpretive ranger doing tours of the cliff dwellings. And I immediately really fell in love with this place. And one thing I didn't expect to love so much about this place uh, were the night skies and especially living here in the park coming outside of our our ranger housing every night and seeing the milky way pretty much every night of the year it's a really magical thing and something that not a lot of americans have access to anymore and i just appreciated it without really thinking about it that much um but when we're talking about dark skies tonight, um, I'd like to start by talking about the dark. The dark is scary, right? When I was a kid, I, I was afraid of the dark. Um, I grew up in Southern California and wasn't nearly as dark as it is here, but I remember our, our, uh, the house I grew up in kind of edged up against the edge of town and looking out into the vastness of the night uh, from, the, from, from our backyard terrified me. The, the unknown of what was out there, hearing uh, the hoots of owls and the howls of coyotes kind of raises the hair on the back of your neck. Are you afraid of the dark? I think a lot of us are. I think a lot of us were as kids at least. Um, it's pretty normal. Uh, studies show that um, about eleven percent of adults admit to a researcher that they are still scared of the dark, and there's very good evolutionary reason for us to be afraid of the dark. Uh, this fear spans back to to our early ancestry. Um, it goes back to images like that. Um, Researchers have hypothesized that this innate fear uh, dates back to when we were nowhere near the top predators, the apex of the food chain we are today. Uh, so predators like this cat here uh, can't really see fine detail or rich color like we can, but they have a superior, a superior ability to be able to see in the dark uh, because they have a lot more rods in their eyes. And the rods are the, the part of our eye that's really sensitive to dim light. So as a result, cats can see um, kind of approximately the same that we can see with one sixth of the light that we would need to see that. Um, we humans don't have a lot of these rod receptors. We have a lot more cones in our eyes and the cones are, are much better at higher light levels. Um, and are capable of seeing lots of colors and a three-dimensional vision of space, of more, more what our ancestors needed to see. But if you think about walking down a street as it's getting dark and how that fear kind of rises in you, even though we're not being hunted usually by, by cats and other big predators today, uh, we're still afraid of this time when our ability to see is decreasing and our potential predators is increasing. And so throughout, throughout human history, we have created artificial light at night. And for the vast majority of that history, that light was not on all the time and it wasn't very bright. Uh, for the vast majority of that history, we were gathering around campfires and talking. And from there, our ancestors developed all sorts of different artificial lights uh, to use at night. Uh, torches, oil lamps, candles, uh, this illustration 
On the upper left is a storm petrel, which is a very oily seabird. And in uh, my ancestral homeland of Scotland, um, people actually would dry out this oily seabird, stick a wick down its throat, and use that as a candle at, at night. And this is because for the majority of human history, lighting at night was incredibly expensive. Uh, wax and oil cost a lot of money. Um, back in Babylonian times, when people are using uh, these clay, clay oil lamps, like you see in the top middle of the image, um, a day's labor would buy you enough oil to light a lamp for about 10 minutes. So this was a very precious resource, being able to see at night. Oops. The first gas street lamps come onto the scene in 1812, followed pretty shortly after by kerosene and then incandescent light bulbs. And so it's really only in the last 0.01% you know, of human history that we have had access to much cheaper lighting. I love this illustration here. Um, this is when Broadway in New York City was first lit by electric light in 1881. And you can see the light with the rays coming out of it in this illustration. But what else do you also see in the sky? Uh, you can still see quite a few stars there. Um, but New York City, as an example of what eventually happened in pretty much the whole world, got lit up very quickly. So by 1913, you can see how much more light there is, um, all the building windows, the avenues. To this year, when New York City is one of the brightest places on the planet. Uh, fun fact, the very single brightest spot in the planet is going to be Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, so not too far from here. And even in a lot of the very dark spots in the West, you can still see the sky glow of very bright cities like Las Vegas or New York. Here's another way to see that evolution um, over the last decades. Um, from the 1950s until uh, projected a few years into the future here, you can see how much brighter the United States has become. Uh, there are these vast tracts of darkness in the American West that are narrowing pretty quickly. And now when you look at the Earth from space, it's very easy to tell where people live. Can you recognize what we're looking at here? This strip of light um, going north is, is the Nile, where the vast majority of the population of Egypt lives, up to the delta. You can see where people don't live in most of the desert on either side of it. Can you recognize where this is? Uh, we're looking at my homeland of Southern California there, that very bright spot in the middle being the, the greater Los Angeles metropolitan area. Uh, I grew up a little bit north of that on the coast in a place called Ventura. This view is one that I didn't have when I was a kid. I remember when I grew up, I was probably 10 years old when I first went out to the desert with my dad, out into the, the, the deep darkness of the Mojave and was kind of shocked and amazed to see this view of the night sky swimming with stars, uh, the Milky Way galaxy you know, shimmering above us. At that time, when I first saw it, I kind of thought this was a a special occasion, like it was an eclipse or a comet passing over. I didn't realize that the sky was like this every night um, out in a dark place like the Mojave Desert. And then I went back to the, the sky glow of the greater Los Angeles metropolitan area and, and uh, up in the sky there you can see about a dozen stars. And in a really bright city like LA, a dozen stars at a time is about all you can see. So what have we, what have we gained? What have we lost? 
by, light, by lighting to such an extent? Which one would we rather have? This view or this view? Surely there are really serious pros and cons to both. Um, some pros that people bring up when I do this as an evening program and I can actually get answers from you real time uh, is you know, a sense of safety, um, you know, the, the ability to go out at night and buy groceries or go on errands or go for a walk, not feel in danger. Um, the ability for the economy to go on 24 hours, uh, seven days a week. Um, there's other reasons too. I mean, I, I'm a ranger. I've chosen to live up here in the national park in a very remote place. But when I go on vacation, I love to go to cities sometimes that the light is dazzling. The ability to do things at all hours is, is wonderful. Um, but then again, I like to come back here. I like to do that every once in a while, not every single day. So we have very few places, really very few places left in the continental United States where you can still see a sky like this, where you can still see the sky that all of our ancestors saw for all of human history, all of our ancestors everywhere, all around the world looked up at the same sky, uh, the sky full of stars and planets and galaxies. And until about a century ago, every night, everywhere in the world was dark. And all around the world, people watched the sky. They watched the stars, the patterns of the rising and setting of the sun and the moon and the planets. And people sat around fires wrapped up in blankets, looking up, telling stories about those celestial bodies and their passage across the sky. And around the world, a lot of those stories are, are similar. People noticed the same things. They had similar explanations. Um, they used those, those patterns in very real ways. Their observations helped them keep track of time and the passage of the seasons. Uh, the stories helped pass down knowledge about weather patterns, animal migrations, um, the rhythm of the seasons through the generations. Um, so you can look up and, and see, you know, the sun is rising over that butte on this day, it's time to plant or it's time to harvest. Um, and, and in that way, the stars you know, connect us in a really real way to our ancestors um, and for, most of human history, they were a way that people passed down knowledge. Here in the Four Corners region was definitely the same. It was no different. Um, up here, uh, we have especially good views of the sky. We have high elevation, um, less atmospheric disturbance, dry climate. Uh, this was a great place to stargaze. And the ancestral people of this landscape, the Pueblo, the Diné, the Nuch, the Apache, um, like people all over the world, they looked up at the sky, they noticed these patterns, they told stories about them. Um, in places like Chaco Canyon here, as well as Chimney Rock and Coven Weep and Mesa Verde, uh, ancestral Pueblo and architecture literally reflected and tracked the movements of the celestial bodies. At Mesa Verde, there's architectural alignments uh, that have been observed by archaeologists uh, at Sun Temple, at Cliff Palace, and Balcony House. And surely there's a lot more that we haven't observed yet because you really need to be in the right place at the right time to see how the architecture reflects the sky sometimes. Um, this is a, a diagram of Sun Temple from above. Uh, this site in particular has, has long been interesting to researchers who are, are drawn to its angles and its lines. Um, Jesse Walter Fuchs, back in the early 20th century, one of the first archaeologists who was active here at Mesa Verde, 
called this place Sun Temple because he theorized that its walls were lined up uh, with the observation of the sun. More recent study, uh, this one is out of Arizona State University it's from about 2015, um, suggests that Sun Temple was built at least in part to aid in observation of the celestial bodies. Um, and they've determined that Sun Temple, when viewed from Cliff Palace across the canyon, would align with the sunset on winter solstice, as well as the moon's southern standstill set. Um, and that's part of a cycle that happens about every 18 and a half years. The walls of Sun Temple um, were, uh, the study, uh, they, they, line, they lined up the building with a computer model of where the stars were in the mid 1200s when we believe that Sun Temple was built. And these walls of Sun Temple were found to align with the rise and set of several celestial bodies which are significant to Pueblo people today, uh, namely Vega, the Pleiades, Rigel. Um, researchers found that these alignments um, in the, with the assumed construction date uh, are well above the statistic probability of accidental alignments. We have a lot more research to be done here. This is just one study. More people need to, to look at these um, at these hypotheses and confirm them. More studies need to be done. More observations need to be done. And this is one thing that I'm really excited about going forward uh, with Mesa Verde as a dark sky park now is to pay more attention to ancestral Pueblo and other ancestral astronomy and um, indigenous knowledge and science that was taking place in Mesa Verde and around the Four Corners region. Suffice it to say, people in the past were paying very close attention to the sky, much more than the average person today is. And today, these dark skies at Mesa Verde are a very important piece of the cultural landscape of this park and of this region. This area is one of the darkest spots in the country, and it's not really intentional. Like, that is an accident. Within national parks, um, we have these incredibly preserved dark skies because national parks don't tend to have a lot of development and bright lights in them. When the National Park Service was created back in 1916 with the Organic Act, Congress um, declared that the, the point of the Park Service was to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife therein and to provide for the enjoyment of the same in such manner and by such means as will leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. And I can guarantee you they were not thinking about dark skies in 1916 because the, the vast majority of the nation was incredibly dark in 1916. These dark skies have been conserved in national parks pretty much by accident. And it's only relatively recently that we have appreciated how special this is and how lucky we are. Um, but it's, you know, it's not all national parks here in the, four in the four corners. A lot of the reason why we have such dark skies here is simply there aren't a lot of people in this part of the country. There aren't a lot of big cities, um, but this is changing. More and more people are, are moving to this area. More development is happening. And lighting is getting less and less expensive uh, as that trajectory from lighting storm petrols and, and lighting for 10 minutes for the full day's labor back in Mesopotamia. Uh, light is now very cheap to produce. Um, this is a, a view of Cedar Tree Tower here in the park. And you can see the, you know, the amazing night sky and the Milky Way rising above Cedar Tree Tower. But you can also see what looks like maybe the sunrise or the sunset, but it's actually the sky glow of cities to the south of us. And so just putting a border on a piece of land and saying we are preserving, um, we are preserving the dark skies and the natural and cultural resources within this line isn't really enough. Um, this is one reason why uh, advocates for dark skies refer to this as light pollution. Um, because light doesn't just stop at the, at the border of the park. Um, 
from a extremely dark place like the Grand Canyon or Death Valley, you can still see the sky glow of Las Vegas. So light pollution is not just all light, it's defined as the inappropriate and excessive use of artificial light. And I don't think any dark sky advocates think that we're going to get rid of lighting at night, nor should we. Uh, lighting at night is good for many things. It's good for safety. Uh, it's, it's important uh, to be able to navigate at night. We have to drive around with lights. We need to, to get safely down paths and up steps and into our houses. Um, but a lot of the way that we light at night does qualify as inappropriate and excessive. And when I took over the project of, of working on getting Mesa Verde its dark sky certification a few years ago, I appreciated dark skies a lot, but I didn't know much about light pollution or about the steps that, that we can take to have much darker skies in places um, all around the country, not just here in Mesa Verde. So, Let's go through some factors about light pollution. Um, bust a few myths here. So first of all, light pollution, the excessive and unnecessary use of light, uh, wastes energy and money. And here are some statistics. Uh, lights, um, at least a third of all the outside lighting in the United States right now is wasteful. Um, that costs about $3 billion a year in the United States. Um, it creates as much pollution um, emissions to, to power those unnecessary lights as 3 million cars driving every year. Brighter also doesn't mean safer. Uh, this, this was a little counterintuitive to me because you think when you're walking down the street and you have bright lights, you can see no lion is going to get you, no robber is going to attack you. Uh, but there's actually never been a scientific study that has found any correlation between lighting and safety. Uh, a very large study in the United Kingdom in 2015 um, had three, three different um, groups of communities. Uh, one group they kept the lighting exactly as it was. One, light, one group, they reduced the lighting in the communities by about half. And then the third group, they turned off outside lights entirely. And between those three groups, they actually found no change at all in incidents of crime, no change at all in traffic road collisions. And this was in 62 municipal municipalities around the United Kingdom. So that, that's a little food for thought there. I still, I still don't quite believe it. Maybe you don't either, but more studies find similar things. Um, a few years ago, the city of Chicago conducted a study uh, where they started lighting alleyways um, to see if that would reduce crime in those neighborhoods. And what they actually found was an increase in crime. Um, the, the theory there is that people who are committing crime at night also need light to see. Uh, there's actually gonna be more robberies and graffiti happening when people can see what they're doing uh, than if it's dark outside. So more studies need to be done here too, I think, but ev evidence suggests that these benefits um, that we get from light are actually balanced out by the dangers posed by poor lighting. And what I mean there is pretty typical outside light um, in the backyard. Does this light really help you see better? Could you see that person standing there with the glare of that light? This is one example of how a lot of our outside lighting is actually designed pretty poorly because a lot of our light goes straight into our eyes, which blinds us to everything around. 
So to design a light that actually helps us, it should be pointed where we need it and not into our eyes. So that means putting um, a shield on it. So the light isn't escaping out the top or the sides, but it's pointed down um, to where we actually need to see at night. Uh, nighttime safety is about having not a lot of light, but the right light in the right place. Um, so far from being contradictory goals, lighting our nights for safety and controlling light pollution actually go hand in hand because a light that is shielded appropriately on the sides and the top also isn't sending a lot of light pollution up into the sky, creating that sky glow. Um, so for me, this is one of the most compelling arguments for reducing and controlling our light at night to actually make us safer. Um, in a similar way, uh, having bright lights uh, along roadways creates a lot of glare, which makes it pretty hard for um, older eyes to see. Uh, eyes that have cataracts, uh, the, the light, very bright lights on roadways um, actually makes it a lot more dangerous to drive than having very low lights that are directed down. Next is artificial light at night is bad for our health. Is this a familiar image for us? I'm a, I'm a ranger, I don't really have cell phone service at my house here in the park, but I still spend way too many evenings looking like this in bed. Um, there's a lot, a lot of research that has gone into the topic of people being awake at, light, at night. A, a lot of us work, work at night, uh, night shifts, there's you know, part of the part of having a city that's going 24 hours a day with bright lights is people are out there working at night, people are traveling by night. And multiple studies um, across many fields of human health have found that being awake at night is actually pretty bad for us. And a lot of that is the exposure to artificial light. So research has linked extended exposure to artificial light, like from our phones or electric lighting in the house, um, have linked that with, with health problems as diverse as depression, obesity, diabetes, cancers, and sleep disorders. And one reason for that is that light at night uh, will interfere with our natural circadian rhythm. And our circadian rhythm, um, when it's interfered with, uh, that suppresses our body's production of melatonin, which our body can only produce in darkness. And light from the stars or candles or a fireplace doesn't disrupt our production of melatonin. But electric light, which is way brighter than those other kinds, will fool our body into thinking it's daytime and stop it from producing melatonin. And melatonin plays a really key role in our immune system. Melatonin plays a key role in keeping cancers from growing specifically. And then looking beyond us and our self-interest, uh, artificial light disrupts ecosystems. Um, there's all these nocturnal species as well as diurnal species, which depend on having a dark night. Um, Artificial light in Florida, for example, leads sea turtle hatchlings away from the moon's reflection on the water and towards the city to their certain doom. Um, amphibians depend on a dark night for their mating cycles. Birds depend on a dark night for navigating by the stars. Uh, birds and moths and, and butterflies and many other migrating animals, um, just like our ancestors, realize that the, the North Star and the constellations around it stay in the same place all year round and actually look for those constellations to navigate by at night. If they can't see those stars, then they're lost. So what can we do about light pollution? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Uh, a few things we can do is reduce the, the lights we have outside our house. And 
I've had multiple people come up to me in the park talking excited about our dark skies here. And they say like, well, what can I, what can I do at home in a, in a city? And the truth is we can actually do a lot on the individual level, talking with our neighbors, uh, working in our towns to starting off just at your house, go around the outside of your house and look at the outside lights. Um, do you need all of them? If you do need them, are they shielded? Um, can you cover up the top of the light and the sides um, so the light is only pointed where you need it? Uh, another thing we can do is just change the bulbs. Um, warmer temperature light is way less polluting. The wavelengths of, um, of kind of warmer oranges, red lights, amber colors uh, doesn't travel as far as the cooler temperatures, like the blues, um, which travel a lot farther. Shielding, minimizing, reducing all these things uh, not only reduces light pollution, but it also saves you money um, on your energy bill. And it might make your neighbors happier to not have your bright night lights shining into their windows at night and interfering with their ability to produce melatonin. Um, so here's pretty simple um, apartment complex. They changed out just a few fixtures and bulbs and you can see the difference in glare. Um, you're still not seeing a lot of stars in the sky, but it looks nicer. It's, it's better for animals, it's better for you. This is one of my favorite cities. Uh, does anyone recognize this view right here? Uh, this is Flagstaff, Arizona. And Flagstaff was the first international dark sky city in the world. And it's a pretty large city of about 120,000 people, larger than the city I grew up in, in California. Um, but they have taken a lot of these steps on a citywide level to reduce their artificial lighting. And as you can see, there's still that classic Route 66, there's neon signs, this looks like a bustling lived in city. Uh, but a, a lot of the color temperature is, is warm and so it's less polluting. Uh, you drive down the big streets in Flagstaff, they still have street lamps, but they are shielded, targeted, and, um, and lower temperature, warmer temperatures, um, lower wattage. Uh, and so from this view of Flagstaff, you can see this bright city night, but you can also see the Milky Way and a bunch of stars above you. Uh, so Flagstaff ends up being darker than a lot of cities that are much smaller than it, actually. So Flagstaff became an international dark city, city uh, under the auspices of the International Dark Sky Association. And uh, this was a group of people that liked dark nights and stars. Uh, they, found, they were founded in 1988 down in Tucson, Arizona uh, to protect the night from light pollution. And Starting in 2001, IDA started the program of International Dark Places. And their goal there was to get the word out about a lot of these topics that I've been talking about, uh, to encourage communities, parks, and protected areas around the world to do more to preserve and protect dark sites um, through having responsible lighting policies and public education. So, the very first international dark sky place um, under this new IDA program was just across the border from us over in Utah um, in Little Natural Bridges National Monument, uh, which is now surrounded by Bears Ears National Monument in Southeast Utah. This was the very first international dark sky park. And uh, I believe that was declared in 2006 or 2007. And the program was, uh, had kind of a slow start, but it's been gaining momentum. And um, this year, Mesa Verde became the 100th International Dark Sky Park. And there have been many more since we got our certification earlier this year. So our efforts to become an International Dark Sky Park began back in 2014. And since then, there have been a lot of rangers, park partners, and volunteers 
uh, who have dedicated themselves to this goal of drawing awareness to Mesa Verde's dark skies and protecting it. So what does it take to become a dark sky park? Um, I volunteered to take on this project um, about two years ago, and I thought it would be pretty easy because when I look outside of my house at night, I see this view basically, not point like that, but this sky. Um, what more could you need to become an international dark sky park than internationally dark skies? Well, it turns out there's a little more to that. Um, and to be honest, I didn't quite know what I got myself into when I volunteered for this project. So that first thing, sky quality readings, is actually determining how dark is the sky, um, documenting the dark skies with photos like that, showing the Milky Way, but also documenting you know, the threats to those dark skies, uh, taking photos of the light domes around the park and measuring those over time to to see how much they're growing. Um, we needed to do an exterior lighting assessment, which was cataloging every single outside light in the park and determining if it was dark sky friendly or not. Then we had to come up with a lighting management plan to uh, figure out what we we're gonna do with all those lights that weren't dark sky friendly, uh, figure out a plan for how to um, put any future lights in. Uh, we had to come up with a plan for how to monitor our darkness over time um, and evaluate um, the threats that our dark skies face. Uh, we also had to demonstrate leadership and partnership in dark sky restoration. So we had to cooperate with um, partnering organizations, get out into the local community uh, to get the message out about dark skies. We had to interpret it for guests. Uh, for visitors here at the park. Uh, and we had to reach out to the community and see if this is something they're willing to, to work with us on. Because as we already talked about, you can't have dark skies all by yourself. You can't just put a board around the park and expect your dark skies to remain there. So these are our photos of uh, light domes around the the area. These were taken by the National Park Service Dark Skies program over the Farview Lodge and from the from the Farview archaeological site, sorry. Um, these are some photos that I took. Uh, this is from the campground from Moorfield Canyon showing the Milky Way. And here's one from the Farview Lodge looking south towards the light domes of Farmington and Shiprock. Then we got one of these little boxes, which is called a sky quality meter, an SQM. And this was one of my favorite parts of becoming a dark sky park was even for rangers, a lot of the park is closed at night. Um, and we put together a group and got special permission to go all around the park at night, taking readings of the dark sky quality. So this was a great opportunity to get out and see some of the, the nocturnal wildlife, um, some of our, our animal neighbors, um, gray foxes, gray horned owls, a mountain lion. Um, and basically all you need to do to take a sky quality meter is get one of these little boxes, you point it up at the zenith straight up, press a button, wait a few seconds for it to beep, and then it gives you a number. And we went to these 13 sites around the park. We took five measurements at each site and the, the number comes in uh, units of magnitude over square arc seconds. And I haven't taken a physics class since high school and didn't care for it very much then. So I really have no idea what magnitude over square arc seconds means, but to qualify as a dark sky park, we were looking for an average number of 21.2. And as you can see here, we had a grand average of 21.334, which is pretty dark. It gets darker, but it also gets a lot brighter. So congratulations. We determined that we do in fact have very dark skies. So this is a, a lot of text. This is, um, I'm glad I didn't have to do this part of our dark sky application. We had help from Dr. Brian Bullinger, who's a professor of civil engineering at Ohio Northern University. 
and he's been very involved in the dark sky movement. And he came out to Mesa Verde and conducted our exterior lighting assessment and inventory. So he went all around the park, took notes on every single outside light in the park. And, you know, I was kind of surprised as a national park, I don't think of us as having a lot of lights. Uh, Dr. Bollinger found 964 lights around the park. And he determined that only about half of those were compliant with dark sky uh, friendly rules. In order to qualify as a dark sky park, we, need to, we, need, we needed to have two thirds of our lighting qualify as dark sky friendly. So the next step was getting from 50% to 67% dark sky friendly lighting. And the place we started there um, on that project was up at the Farview Lodge. This is the largest concentration of outside lighting in the park. Uh, about 42% of all of the outdoor lighting in the park is around the lodge. Um, and this picture on the right here, you can see the old lighting at the lodge. And I actually grabbed this photo from a TripAdvisor review for the lodge where the person gave it one star because of its terrible dark sky lighting. Uh, all we did to fix the dark sky lighting was take out some light bulbs and put in new ones. So our uh, park partner, Mesa Verde Museum Association, purchased for us 284 dark sky friendly LED light bulbs. So those are under uh, 2700K, under 500 lumens, warm color light, LED light bulbs. Uh, they donated those to us and we changed out 150 bad bulbs for the dark sky friendly bulbs around the lodge. And I know there is a joke in here about how many rangers it takes to change out a light bulb, um, but I'm going to refrain from making it. It was two terms of two teams of volunteers and a couple of rangers uh, that spent a day going around the lodge changing out 150 bulbs. Um, that's really easy. Uh, and we can all do that around our homes and make a big difference. We don't need to buy new fixtures or really fundamentally rethink how we're lighting when all we really need to do is change our light bulbs. Um, I lived uh, in the park housing next to the lodge my first season here in 2015, and the lodge was bright. Uh, if you wanted to, to really appreciate the stars, you had to go away from the lodge. Now, you can go up to the lodge and there's still some light bulbs that need to be changed, but you can see the Milky Way coming right out of one of those hotel rooms. And so that was an extremely easy, inexpensive fix that really improved the, the visitor's experience um, of dark skies at Mesa Verde. So once that project was completed, Dr. Bollinger came back looked at all our lights again and verified that now 67 and a half percent of our exterior lighting was now compliant with IDA standards. Um, we signed an agreement with Aramark um, to, uh, to change all of the, the light bulbs in the concession run facilities, the rest of them in the lodge, plus the lights down in the campground. And once that project is complete, we're going to be to 90% dark sky compliant. Uh, we still have 130 of those light bulbs and we're working with Aramark right now to change out more bulbs in the campground. And um, as a dark sky park, we have a commitment to get to 100% dark sky compliant exterior lighting within 10 years. But I think we should be able to do it within a few years. Uh, we should be far ahead of schedule because we have great momentum on that, on that project already. Um, here's a picture of employee lighting down uh, in Moorfield, uh, down by the campground. And this is dark sky friendly, warm, shielded lighting. Um, this, is, this is an easy thing to do to really improve the, the park experience for people who live here, for visitors, and for the wildlife that we share this park with. So, once we had all that work done, we assembled all those pieces from that list. We applied to be an international dark sky park uh, last November. Uh, the IDA um, board reviewed our application. 
and certified us in April. It came as a pleasant surprise that we were the 100th International Dark Sky Park. That was pretty fun. Um, and now there are 177 certified dark sky, dark sky places in 21 countries uh, around the world. And it's been uh, very exciting since then. We've gotten a lot of media publicity, especially being the 100th International Dark Sky Park. Uh, CBS Morning News was out here uh, filming a story about Mesa Verde's Dark Skies, which um, should be airing in October. Uh, I've been out to dinner in Cortez and Mancus, and I've heard people talking about Mesa Verde dark skies uh, at neighboring tables. And it's just, it's just a, it's really fun to have so much excitement and energy around this right now. We have a lot left to do. Um, we, we need to get to 100% dark sky compliant. Uh, I get an email pretty much every week from, uh, from the park website of someone who's been to the park and points out some lighting that's not dark sky compliant, uh, lighting that's shining into their campsite and interrupting their views. So we do still have some work left to do there. We wanna do that as quickly as possible to protect Mesa Verde's dark skies as much as possible. Um, we're really excited to do more outreach to our neighboring communities and to tribal communities um, to build regional partnerships to keep the Four Corners region dark as a whole. Um, we, we need to be in this together. Uh, we can't do it by ourselves. Um, we're really excited to develop some programs and interpretation on native astronomy uh, to collaborate with tribal communities on building programs centered around uh, indigenous science knowledge, the, the astronomical knowledge um, that we see here in Mesa Verde, the stories that are protected in the stars that tie people to their ancestors and to this whole and to this region. Um, that's something that's so exciting to be talking about and to be excited about. We're really excited about some dark sky uh, festival events we have coming up. Um, this coming weekend on Friday and Saturday, we'll be having special events on Friday and Saturday night, um, evening programs in the campground amphitheater, uh, celebrating our certification as a dark sky park. On Friday night, we'll be having an astrophotography workshop with Betty Maya Foote, who's a fantastic uh, astrophotographer and a member of the IDA. And, um, Saturday and or Friday and Saturday night, we'll be having a talk on astronomy by uh, CU professor Eric, Dr. Erica Ellingson. Next week, we'll be having uh, outreach library events at the Mancus Cortez and Dolores libraries um, with crafts and stargazing and astronomy talks. Uh, so if you're in the area, I encourage you to come on out to these events and they'll all be held outside and we'll be um, We'll be doing our best to, to socially distance um, and do it as, as safely as, as we possibly can. Um, but uh, we're, we're really excited to, to see the community and to and continue this momentum on dark sky protection uh, in the area. Going forward, um, we're going to be doing a lot more dark sky programs in the park. So please stay tuned. This summer, um, we had evening programs in the campground every weekend about dark skies in the park. Um, in the past, we've had dark sky uh, um, stories and telescope viewing at special events uh, like Winterfest that we have in January. We've had star parties in the fall uh, and at our Luminaria where the, the cliff dwellings are lit up with lanterns in December. And you know, going forward uh, in this strange pandemic time, I'm not exactly sure uh, which of those special events will be happening this fall and winter, but stay tuned. And, and going forward, Mesa Verde will be hosting a lot more events um, celebrating and enjoying our dark skies. Uh, I, I come back to the fact that one of my my favorite thing is about the dark skies um, of Mesa Verde is that they, 
They inspire us. They're beautiful. They're not just important. They're beautiful. I love this quote from Wendell Berry, uh, one of my favorite writers. He wrote, to go in the dark with a light is to know the light. To know the dark, go dark. Go without sight and find that the dark too blooms and sings and is traveled by dark feet and dark wings. And I'm going to leave us with one of my favorite images by Jan Wright. And thanks for joining us tonight, Jan. Uh, uh, Luminaria, Night Magic. And to me, uh, this image, which, uh, which Jan made while she was an artist in residence here at Mesa Verde a few years ago, just captures everything I love about this place. The dark skies, uh, the ancestral villages, the, the sense that this, in this place, at least, if time breaks down, it's not, we're not separated by a thousand years from our ancestors, but they're right there. Um, this sense of this place really as, a, as alive and the sky is alive and it's all being connected um, where we can be amazed and inspired by this expansive universe overhead and recall the holiness and, and mystery of this creation that we're part of. So thank you for coming out tonight and talking dark skies with me. Um, thanks for having me and I, I'll be happy to answer any questions and, and point you in the direction that you need to go. <laughs> thank you very much, Spencer, for, uh, for the presentation. Um, we are happy to have Spencer answer any questions you might have. Please feel free to just put your questions in the chat box um, and I will read them so that Spencer can address them. Um, while we're waiting, though, because it does take a couple of seconds for people to add their uh, questions there to the chat box, Spencer, I'm curious as to where in the park you would recommend someone go to view the dark skies. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And as you probably already know, um, access is kind of limited at night at Mesa Verde. Uh, in order to protect the archeological sites, uh, a lot of gates get locked at night. Um, the, the whole park road that you get from the entrance up to the museum does stay open all night. And there are lots of great pullouts along that road, uh, which are some of my favorite spots to go out and take photos of the Milky Way and to enjoy the night sky. And then, of course, the two places where people stay overnight in the park, uh, the campground and the lodge, those are both great places to see dark skies. Mm -hmm. And especially as we're working on improving the lighting in those areas, uh, they will become all the better. I think the campground especially uh, is, is a really dark place uh, because it's in this valley and it's protected from a lot of the, the glow from neighboring communities. Wonderful. Anyone else have any questions you would like for Spencer to answer? Oh, we do. What kind of support do you get from the National Park Service for these initiatives? Is there common fund for lighting improvements at different parks? Oh, also a great question. Um, there's, there's a lot of support, actually. There's a National Park Service uh, night Sky and Natural Sounds Division, and they're headquartered up in the Denver area. And so when, when I first took over uh, our application and was a little overwhelmed by all this technical jargon and those pages and pages of data on all of our exterior lights, and I wasn't really sure what to do with all of that, uh, I, I reached out to the Night Sky Division and they really held my hand and walked me through a lot of that and put me in touch with people in the area like Betty Maya Foote, who took a few of those dark sky photos in the presentation and works for IDA. Um, so uh, there, there's, there's a lot of interest in it. And a lot of parks in this area are becoming um, dark sky parks right now. Canyons of the Ancients National Monument is working on their application. And I think they'll probably um, become the newest uh, park in the area. And a lot of parks around here are already dark sky parks. So we're, we're sharing resources more and more 
tomorrow I'm, I'm driving down to Aztec National Monument to pick up an inflatable planetarium that they, the Chaco and Aztec have with use in programs and to get trained on how to, how to use that in programs here. Um, and um, Mesa Verde put in a, a project grant to cover the cost of all of our, our lighting retrofits. And um, that looks like it will probably get approved this year and we'll fund um, that whole project of retrofitting a lot of our historical lighting where um, for the historical integrity, it's a little, more, a little more difficult than just putting a new fixture on, but we've got to get a little more creative about how, how we do that. Um, so yeah, I've, I have felt a lot of support luckily. <laughs> Wonderful. Anyone else interested in asking a question? You're about to see my nerd side come out if you don't ask questions. Ah, here we go. Seth Bradley, do you have to get a recertification periodically? And if so, how often do you have to do that? Um, yeah, so every year we need to submit a, a progress report to IDA. Um, we have to take those, those measurements with the, the sky quality meter every year from the same spot. So part of the reason for that is to track how of light from the neighboring communities and light from inside the park is, is changing the dark sky quality from year to year. Um, I think that rather than it being a recertification, it's kind of like proving that we shouldn't have it taken away from us. Um, part of what IDA wants us to do also is, you know, be advocates for dark skies, get out in the community, do evening programs and special events like this uh, to get the word out about dark skies. So again, it's not as simple as just having dark skies, but it's really being, uh, being an active uh, uh, advocate for dark skies. Um, so we don't have to submit a progress report this year because we were just certified. Um, but next year, I'm already excited to get out uh, to the you know, dark corners of Weatherall Mesa at night and see some more wildlife. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Anyone else? These are great questions. So while we're waiting for someone to type in another question, Seth, um, or Spencer, I'm sorry, I was talking to Seth here. A second ago, Spencer, um, you mentioned doing some programs on what the ancestral people, the ancient people, really saw in the skies. And how will you go about that? What does that entail? Um, well, we're, we're really excited to build some programs with tribal communities. Um, there's uh, a great group. Some of you may have this book already. If you don't, I'm really enjoying it. You can see I'm marking it all. It's called Sharing the Sky, and it's about uh, Western and Navajo astronomy. And it's by a, a group, um, Native Sky Watchers, uh, which is, is interpreting indigenous astronomy and indigenous science in really cool ways. Um, We've been in, in some conversations with some of our tribal partners about how to build programs uh, like science programs with tribal schools and really get them excited about um, what their ancestors were doing here at Mesa Verde and how that's, you know, it's not just archaeology, it's not just ritual, it is science. Uh, you see that in, in places like um, Sun Temple, uh, where these, these studies recently are showing um, extremely sophisticated uses of astronomical knowledge and geometry and architecture kind of all coming together in this place that we can still see it. Um, I mean, it's obvious that, that our ancestors were all looking at the, the stars, but it's so, so exciting to me to get into the of that. What were, what were people seeing in the sky? How are they using that knowledge um, in their everyday life? And in, in some of the, the, the um, descendant communities like Hopi and Zuni, there are still members of the community um, who are in charge of making these, yeah, these observations of the swift celestial bodies. And that helps to set the ritual calendar um, in places like uh, Shingopudi on the second mesa. Um, so we're, we're excited to work more with the tribes on 
building that knowledge. And we respect that uh, a lot of knowledge about the sky <laughs> is not for outside consumption. Um, I spoke with, uh, with Governor Brian Bio at Acoma Pueblo, for example, and he said like, oh yes, dark skies are very important. We're really happy with everything we're doing, but really that's private knowledge and we're not allowed to share any of that with the outside world. So helping people understand that it's important, even if we can't give all the details, uh, I think it is, is, a, is an important thing that we can be doing here at Mesa Verde too. Um, the, the, these skies are a, are a cultural resource, not just a natural resource. That is wonderful. Now we have two questions coming in. Another one from Seth. And he says, are there neighbors or close towns that do not cooperate? And what towns might interfere with the dark skies? Um, so when we were working on our application, we reached out to our neighboring communities and we got letters of support for our project from all of them. So from Cortez, Mancus, Dolores, um, Durango. Uh, I think there's a lot of interest in the area in dark skies and we recognize um, that it's it's like it's a boon to our quality of living to have the Milky Way above us, but it's also uh, an, an economic boon. You know, people come here to enjoy the dark skies. People are coming to Mesa Verde this year to see the dark skies, not not just to see the cliff dwellings, but they're coming here expressly for that reason. Um, the city of Cortez website has a picture of uh, dark sky over the Mesa uh, as their main picture on their website. Um, I've heard, I've talked to community members in Mancus who are excited to get Mancus declared as a dark sky community. Um, going forward, I would like to work more with communities that are farther afield too, because you know it's not just about the communities that are right next door, um, but like we we see the lights from from cities that are across the border down in New Mexico and in Utah and working together to you know, get the word out and improve dark skies all around the whole Four Corners region is something that I am excited to be doing more of going forward, especially as a lot of national parks in all these Four Corners states um, are now or are now working on becoming dark sky parks. Wonderful, and then one from Jan. Jan, thanks for that beautiful artwork that we got to see there at the end. Jan asks, does the work include archaeoastronomy, and is there someone at the park who specializes in studying alignments with star and lunar events? Yeah, great question, too. Um, there is not someone in the park that specializes in it, and um, coming from an archaeological background myself, I think there has been a healthy skepticism about archaeoastronomy in the archaeological community. There's a lot of kind of hokey ancient aliens alignment stuff um, in decades past, especially, which I think has kind of given archaeoastronomy a bad name. Um, so we have this speaker coming in, Dr. Erica Ellingson, who's professor of astronomy at CU Boulder. And uh, she's going to be doing a talk about archaeoastronomy, and she's a, she's really working on kind of making it a more scientifically credible um, discipline. And I haven't met her yet, but I've been very I'm really excited to see this talk, and I know that she's excited to start working with our archaeologists in the park on on getting some more studies going. Is really there hasn't been a lot of it done. It's just been a couple of individuals who've been doing this work on their own. And hopefully going forward, we can, we can be a little more systematic and scientific about it. Wonderful. So any other questions? This is kind of your last opportunity here. I just posted Spencer's um, email in the chat box in case other questions come up as you're talking about this with a friend or, um, you know, sharing the knowledge that you learned today and just need a little more to share. Spencer has graciously agreed to answer your emails. Um, also, for those who weren't able to attend um, or who missed a portion of the program, you will be able to view a recording of this program at, on our website within the next couple of days. We will post a link to the recording 
And of course, you're welcome to share that with all of your friends as well. Great. Yeah, well, and please, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. If you uh, if you want links to any of the information or the photos uh, in my presentation, I'm happy to talk more about dark skies. Uh, and thanks for coming out tonight. And thanks for having me, Shannon and Mesa Verde Foundation. Uh, it's really been a pleasure to chat with you all tonight. Well, we appreciate you sharing with us. Um, I know it's something that I'm really passionate about. So um, thanks for sharing your knowledge. And um, thanks to everyone for attending. We, of course, appreciate your support. We can't do these webinars if you don't come out and um, participate. So thank you to everyone. And I hope that you all have a wonderful evening and join us next month for our webinar in October. Bye. Bye-bye.